an awkward case of nepotism, fights with writers and directors, and alcohol-fueled subterfuge are just some of the stunning details in these stories of actors being unceremoniously replaced. In the 2013 science fiction romance Her, Joaquin Phoenix plays a man named Theodore, who is struggling to let go of his ex-wife and commit to another person. So, he downloads a personal assistant program outfitted with an artificial intelligence named Samantha, and their relationship evolves into something deeper as she evolves her own programming. During filming, Phoenix had a real-life Samantha to deliver his lines to in the form of Samantha Morton, but when director Spike Jones got to the editing room in post-production, he realized that the movie needed something else. So, he ended up recasting Samantha as Scarlett Johansson. This required four extra months of recording sessions for Phoenix. And it doesn't sound like he was happy about that. As he told the Los Angeles Times about Morton, She was my partner. She was always in my head. She created Theodore as much as I did. As Marty's dad, George McFly, Crispin Glover was an essential piece of the first Back to the Future. But then for the two sequels, he was replaced by Jeffrey Weissman. In the years since, Glover said that his quibbles with the ending of the original film angered director Robert Zemeckis. As the actor explained to Den of Geek in 2013, I thought it was not a good idea for our characters to have a monetary reward, because it basically makes the moral of the movie that money equals happiness. Glover also said that producer and co-writer Bob Gale inaccurately claimed that he asked to be paid as much as Michael J. Fox for part two. According to Glover, the problem was that he was being offered less than half as much as his co-stars Leah Thompson and Tom Wilson. Whatever the actual reason for the switch, Thompson wasn't exactly happy about it. In the book We Don't Need Roads, The Making of the Back to the Future trilogy, she called Glover a bit of a handful. But as she also noted, you definitely got your money's worth. Weissman actually wore a latex face mold to look more like Glover, and he claimed that his fellow actors barely bothered to learn his name. Thompson even referred to him as the guy playing Crispin. Glover would later win a settlement from Universal for using his likeness without his permission. Now Beth, don't con me. Changing directors often leads to cast reshuffling, and when the 2015 Pixar flick The Good Dinosaur replaced Bob Peterson with Peter Sohn, that spelled pink slips for most of the voice cast. Sohn decided that he needed to find a younger actor for the main character of Arlo. So, he replaced 29-year-old Lucas Neff with 13-year-old Raymond Ochoa. As Sohn explained to Yahoo, everything else, all the other characters that supported that story came in and out and changed and evolved and through that evolution, some of those performers changed out of it. In addition to Neff, Sohn also sent Neil Patrick Harris, John Lithgow, Bill Hader, and Judy Greer packing. Lithgow said that he expected to be re-recording some of his dialogue following the change in director. So clearly he didn't expect to be cut out entirely. Sohn ultimately stood by his decision. As he explained to The Independent, It's a tough thing, but I believe everything we had done in the previous version helped us out. 1999's The Mummy is an action-adventure classic. But at the time, it was a surprise hit that cemented Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz's places in Hollywood. The pair would go on to return in 2001 for the first sequel, The Mummy Returns. Then the next sequel, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, didn't arrive until 2008, and when it did, it was missing Vice. As John Hanna, who played Vice's brother in the series, explained in an interview with The Scotsman, that was a pretty Hollywood moment. I couldn't really figure out how Jonathan would be in it if Rachel wasn't. It never occurred to me that they'd just recast it. Hanna also claimed that Vice was initially on board for Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, and filming was delayed when she had a baby. But then something happened, and she was replaced with Maria Bello. Fraser soldiered on with the new version of his wife, but as he told Collider, I felt Rachel's absence when I read the screenplay the first time. We were partners. We were colleagues. We were friends. And I couldn't read the screenplay and not think about hearing her say it this way or that way. We had that chemistry. Things got ugly when director Rob Cohen claimed that Vice's vanishing act was due to her character now being a mother to an older son. Something that she's denied. Well, I wish you would do it sooner rather than later before you ruin my career the way you've ruined yours. 1967's pill-popping, Hollywood-skewering camp classic Valley of the Dolls was based on the novel of the same name by Jacqueline Suzanne, who modeled her characters on actual show business personalities. A couple of her characters were based on such legends as Ethel Merman and Judy Garland. Sticking close to the book's gossipy roots, Garland was originally cast in the film as aging stage star Helen, while Patty Duke played the part of Neely. As Duke recalled in a 2009 interview, I worshipped her. She made me laugh every time she looked at me. But just a couple days into the shoot, Garland was unceremoniously fired at the command of director Mark Robson. As Duke recalled, she had to come in at 6.30 in the morning, and he wouldn't even plan to get to her until 4 in the afternoon. According to Duke, during this wait, Garland was plied with wine and other things so that she wouldn't be able to function properly on set. She was ultimately replaced by Susan Hayward, and the entire Valley of the Dolls crew was upset about this rather unfortunate turn of events. One of the most infamous cast replacements in cinema history happened in 1990 with the highly anticipated Godfather Part 3. 
its two predecessors are among the most beloved films of all time, so the expectations were naturally high. Adding to the pressure was the pivotal casting of Mary Corleone, the daughter of Al Pacino's Michael. The character proved much harder to cast than anticipated. The rumored first choice of Julia Roberts reportedly left for a part in Flatliners, while Madonna also read for the role but was deemed too mature. Most tragically, Rebecca Schaefer was murdered on the morning of her audition. Ultimately, Winona Ryder was cast and flew to Rome for filming shortly after wrapping Mermaids. Unfortunately, she became ill from exhaustion and exited on the advice of a doctor. This left the production scrambling to find a new Mary several weeks into filming. Director Francis Ford Coppola ultimately ended up casting his own 19-year-old daughter, Sophia. It was reported that this didn't sit well with the cast, who allegedly took issue with what they saw as nepotism. An extra was quoted saying to Entertainment Weekly, she couldn't pronounce the name Corleone. Her father had to keep cutting and retaking the scene. She was in over her head. Tony says that I'm a front for the foundation. That you're using me just to pull the strings. The Silence of the Lambs is quite the rarity among Oscar Best Picture winners. It was a bloody genre flick that won over general audiences just as much as it did the often stodgy voters of the Academy. Plus, it was based on just one book in a series by author Thomas Harris. So, another gory psychological thriller starring Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter was undoubtedly on the table. And so, Hannibal went into production in 2000, with Hopkins on board to reprise his iconic Oscar-winning role. But not so eager for a rehash was his fellow Oscar-winning co-star Jodie Foster, who decided against returning as FBI ace Clary Starling. As reported by The Guardian, she objected to the sequel's premise, which found her character brainwashed by Hannibal and joining him in feasting on human flesh. The script was rewritten to get around those plot elements, but at that point, Foster was still saying no. A source close to Hopkins told The Guardian that he was absolutely furious with Foster's actions. While her lack of interest initially threw the entire production into question, it was saved when Julianne Moore agreed to step in as Clarice. It's still one of the most famous switcheroos in television history. Suddenly, some guy who wasn't Dick York was playing Darren Stevens on the classic sitcom Bewitched. The show also starred Agnes Moorhead as the witch in Dora mother to the main witch Samantha, played by Elizabeth Montgomery. And Dora cared so little for her son-in-law Darren that she never got his name right. And I want to thank you for your compliment, Darwin. Darren! In reality, though, Moorhead reportedly really liked Dick York. But when health problems forced him to leave the show in 1969, producers brought in another Dick, and Dick Sargent took over the part as if nothing had happened. But Moorhead was furious. At Sargent's first table read, she reportedly stood up and shouted, I am not fond of change. Sargent later revealed that Moorhead also said while he was in earshot, they should never meddle with success. Sargent took that to mean, Dick York should never have been replaced, which I thought was a very cruel and unthinking thing to say in front of me. The Honeymooners, a landmark sitcom about a working-class Brooklyn couple, famously ran for just one 39-episode season on CBS from 1955 to 1956. But before they had their own show, bus driver Ralph Cramden and his acerbic wife Alice were featured in a series of comedy sketches first on the Dumont Network's Cavalcade of Stars in 1951, and then the Jackie Gleason show on CBS the following year. Now, get my stuff! <laughs> get in yourself! The earliest Dumont shorts are a little different from what fans of the show might remember. Ralph and Alice's relationship is more fraught. Art Carney appears as a policeman in the first short rather than as neighbor-slash-sidekick Ed Norton. And Alice is played by Pert Kelton. Kelton was a vaudeville-trained performer with a film career stretching back to the 1920s. But when Jackie Gleason moved his operation from Dumont to CBS in 1952, he wasn't allowed to bring her along. The reason had nothing to do with the quality of her performance and everything to do with the politics of the time. In 1950, Kelton and her husband, actor Ralph Bell, were named in the book Red Channels, a compendium of alleged communists working in the entertainment industry. Despite having little to no official political affiliations at the time, Kelton was blacklisted by CBS. Much to Gleason's chagrin, he initially refused to consider any other actress to play Alice, but he eventually relented and recast the part, first with Ginger Jones for a touring live show, and then with Audrey Meadows, who made the role famous on The Jackie Gleason Show and then on The Honeymooners. The official line for Kelton's departure was that she had chronic health issues. One of the most notorious flops in television history was 1976's The Brady Bunch Variety Hour. Produced by Sid and Marty Croft, it reunited the cast of The Brady Bunch for a weekly hour of singing, dancing, and comedy. The only problem was that, with the exception of Florence Henderson, none of the original cast was all that adept at singing, or dancing, or sketch comedy. The show was a train wreck right from the start and lasted just nine episodes. Susan Olsen, who played baby sister Cindy and co-wrote a book about the disastrous series, put it bluntly in a 2009 interview when she said, It was a spectacular turd. Not every member of the Brady cast was quite so willing to make a fool of themselves, though. Former Jan Brady star Eve Plum declined to join the Variety Hour, fearing the possibility of getting locked into a multi-year contract. A humorous concern in hindsight. 
In order to keep the symmetry of three sons and three daughters, the show brought in a new Jan in the form of Jerry Rochelle, who's since become somewhat affectionately known as Fake Jan. Many in the cast were disappointed that Plum didn't come back, especially Olsen, who had grown up beside her for five years on the Brady Bunch. As she recalled, I was happy for her, and I was jealous of her, because she was moving on.